All right, hello everyone. Before we get into it, I have to promote this new project of arts. He illustrated Street Cop by Robert Coover, published by Isolari. Uh, there's a link in the description to get a copy of this. I, I, this part of the video, we really didn't even talk about this at all, so I had to make sure that I had this little intro to plug it. Thanks a lot, enjoy the video. Hey. Hi, nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you. Let me pour a cup of caffeine for me as well. Yeah. Art, is that the apartment that you've always lived in in New York? Yeah, in fact, this room, this very room, uh, is where you may have seen old photos of Francois on a printing press. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was this place before it got built up into being something else, you know? Oh, wow. So you guys used to print raw in that? Well, she did. I didn't do the printing. I would just do the heavy lifting. We live in a four floor walk up loft. Uh, so it has the benefits of skylights oh yeah uh but nevertheless carrying paper up and printed objects down four flights of steep stairs that look like caligari built them um <laughs> is probably you know good for longevity if you can take it but uh she was the printer i mean she really like dived in and learned how to print and we had this multi in our loft here before we had kids like now I was going to give you the tour of my studio, but I was too lazy to try to go and set it up over there. So in the house part of our house, if, I don't even know if I can make this work. You can see that banister up there? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that was our kids' room. Well, we just had one. And then the room under it, that one up there is like a half-height Alper Jerry size room. Below it was my studio for a very long time. But when we had two kids, I needed to be elsewhere. So that was about four or five blocks away from here. Oh. Uh, and this became a place where you couldn't leave toxic inks around because kids would taste it or something, you know? So, yeah. uh, so this started changing its uh, uh, entire configuration when the babies came. So that's the, I'm trying to figure out which uh, apartment it was that you lived in, in the, the strip that you did in breakdowns. Uh, so everyone moves to New York, uh, feels depressed. That was still Brooklyn. I'm still depressed, but no. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that was, in fact, I think it has my, my super is in that strip in one panel or something. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I don't think I have a strip about my uh, Manhattan apartment uh, up in the a uh, little further uptown than this, but it had the, uh, uh, that was the place where I ended up doing the later issues of arcade work and working for Topps Bubblegum and Playboy. And that was mostly out of 16th Street. How did you meet Woody Gelman? Did you know him when you went to San Francisco? Oh, yeah. I mean, I met him when I was uh, 14 years old. Whoa, I did, oh, okay. I didn't know it went that far back. Yeah, I think it was 14, maybe 15. Uh, and it was on a whim. I, I collected mostly non-baseball cards that had like Jack Davis and Wally Wood drawings and stuff like that. Not baseball I'm allergic to, but... At some point, I at that point worshipped uh, Jack Davis's work, especially, and I wanted to look at some originals. And I figured there's nothing lower than a bubblegum company. Maybe they wouldn't mind parting with some of their, uh, at least the baseball card spot cartoons. It would say like Willie Mantle could hit with two hands and one foot, or whatever the baseball fact was. And he would illustrate them very quickly. And so I called up and weirdly was put through to Woody Gelman, who's the head of the creative department there, and said in my voice that I think was still changing, I'd like to get some Jack Davis originals. And somehow I was put to the head of creative development department, Woody. And uh, I was talking to him for a few minutes and I said I was doing my own little rather terrible, but I didn't say rather terrible, uh, amateur uh, fanzine type magazine printed in purple ink called Blase because uh, I thought it would be more sophisticated than mad and Jay Lynch was working for it because I knew him from around that time on we were corresponding he was in Florida uh, I was in Queens and he said well why don't you come down and bring me your magazine and I'll swap you a copy for uh, some Jack Davis originals which I did as soon as I could arrange it and what happened that was kind of uncanny was um, we both seemed to have a shared love for old comics, him knowing and having all of it, old comics, strip paper, whatever. Basically, we both started talking about old comics and he had never met anybody who knew Little Nemo. Uh, and I knew very little, but knew some. And um, 
we just talked up a storm. Then after I went back, he, he had unbeknownst to me, uh, put a little paper clip with paper because it was in the uh, dark ages before post-its. Mm -hmm. said, call this kid when he turns 18. And he put down my parents' number. Wow. And then he said, like, so would you like to work at Tops? He wrote a letter. And I said, uh, I've got to go to college and avoid the draft. Uh, could I work there during the summer or something? Because that sounds great. And so I had a summer job there at Tops out in the depths of Brooklyn, Red Hook, uh, which at the time in the book about uh, uh, Tops Bubblegum, it said in a neighborhood even Joey Gallo wouldn't go to at night. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty sorted and seedy out by the uh, Brooklyn Navy Yards. And uh, I worked there for the summer, but in the course of the summer, I invented a job for myself that hadn't existed before. And so anytime I wanted for the next 20 years, I could do that job. So sometimes half-assedly on staff, sometimes uh, by um, mail while I was riding around the United States in a Ford Econoline van that had a drawing table and bed in it. And I'd mm -hmm. say, send the next check to Crested Butte, Colorado and stuff, you know? Uh, so it was a really long lasting relationship. Did you have an office there in the desk? Yeah. Wow. yeah tops. I had one when I wanted it. And when I wasn't there, I don't know what they used it for, but I had a, I had a room that I worked in. At a certain point, I got Bob Stewart a job there, B-H-O-B, Stewart, yeah. fan and cartoonist. Um, so he would be there five days a week and I'd go in one and we'd share it. Later on, there's something that was called a conference room, but there's nobody to confer in it. So I worked there. And then after I'd gotten New, uh, Mark Newgarden, a yeah. job where we'd share it when I came in uh, the conference table. Uh, so it was a fine setup. It was my school, basically. And, and yeah. Woody would let me come out and spend weekends with him uh, at his house in Long Island, where they'd put me up. And his basement was just like to die for. You know, Here's three complete runs of Life magazine when it was a humor magazine. One of them I'm ripping up so I can put all the Harrison Katie and other great artists in file folders so it, it's more accessible. The other copies were ripping up when things were on the back, making a separate folder for the, whatever it would be, Charles Dana Gibson drawing on the back. And here's the run I keep as it should be. And just piles and piles of newspaper and wow. ephemera, paper ephemera. Did he so know that, Bill Blackbeard? Oh, did I? No, sure. did he? Did, did Woody? Yes, yes, they were in touch, absolutely. Okay. There were no, there's nobody doing this stuff back yeah. then. Yeah, you know? and I don't even understand how you would have even known about uh, like Windsor McKay or any of these artists at that time, because I, I imagine there weren't a lot of books about comics history. Oh, very little. I think there was, um, let's see, comics and their creators, mm -hmm. uh, the Colton Wall book on the comics. And the book that changed me was when I was about 13, there's a book called Comic Art in America by Stephen Becker. And uh, that was a pretty good one although it had a lot of factual errors I found out later. And they'd have little panels of various strips that opened up an entire planet I didn't know about. You know, like they wouldn't have a complete Little Nemo, but they'd have a, a two panel part of it. And then in the Colton War book, I think there was a color plate. Uh, so I got a sense of what this stuff was. And then after I got Comic Art in America, libraries back then were not all microfilm, which was a CIA plot, as you may or may not know. I do not know that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it really was. Uh, it was invented by the CIA for, I guess, keeping good track of uh, their dossiers on every communist in America or whatever. Oh, okay. um, but then some enterprising uh, uh, people, I think from the CIA, but maybe not, maybe just in liaison with the CIA, started peddling it to libraries saying, this is great. You're going to free up all this space. You won't need newspapers, mm. bound volumes in your available space. You can have it all on this nice little disc that will last forever. So as you know, it doesn't. And as you also know, it was terrible for comics. They either leave them out or print them in black and white, of course. But back in the day, libraries, every major branch of a library had uh, bound volumes. Mm -hmm. And that became like a, a real major uh, haunt for me. So oh. I got to read old Billy DeBeck strips and whatever I got interested in, Crazy Cat. And then through Gelman, that of course opened up way further. Yeah. See, I, I was in um, Columbus, Ohio for a while. I lived there and uh, I would go and look at, you know, Woody Gelman has files there where a lot of his artwork wound mm -hmm. up, a lot of like the McKay pages, I think. Are the ones that they show you, like when you're on tour, they open it up. And here's the Windsor McKay and it's like this giant page. 
and it's like I've you know I've been there like with cartoonists who just like start crying in front of those pages because it's just like the actual man touched this you know like oh my god I mean it's, it is yeah. impressive uh and and he had like he had an amazing collection of these things I think he had a pretty much a complete run of Nemo mm -hmm. uh, but he also had a lot of originals and the way he got them is an amazing story actually uh um which is before he was working full-time at Topps Bubblegum, he and Ben Solomon, another animator from the Fleischer Studios, uh, who was the head of the art department and a diametrically opposite uh, personality from Woody, as dour and unpleasant uh, mm -hmm. as Woody was uh, effervescent. Um, and they both had some kind of advertising agency where they basically had been given the assignment to come up with Bazooka Joe, what became Bazooka Joe, and other things for Tops. But they had a lot of clients, and some t at some point, he was given the gig of doing something with uh, an agency, and went to the agency and met the guy who was running it, and saw that all of the uh, surrounding tables in this place had Windsor McKay originals on them. Said, What's that? That's what made me want to become a cartoonist, says Woody. And this guy whose name was Robert Windsor McKay said, oh yeah, that's my dad's stuff. Uh, and he said, well, what, why do you have them out here? He says, well, we've got to protect the tables from the razor cuts and the coffee cup stains. And he said, how can you do this? Like, this is a treasure. Nobody else knew there was a treasure at that point. Certainly not Robert Windsor McKay, whose response was something like, according to Woody, nah, like I tried to do stuff with it. Nobody wants this shit. Uh, and then Woody said, I want it. Can I, can I buy it from you? He said, no, nah, nobody wants it. Uh, and so Woody, much to his great credit, uh, dishonesty in the service of history, uh, came in at night because he had a key and stole all of them. <laughs> and so he had an amazing, amazing collection of Little Nemo's, much of which is what you were seeing at uh, the Columbus Library. Yeah. Uh, and it, it launched him on collecting all those Sunday pages of it and whatever. Uh, so I just thought that was an amazing thing to do and really perfect. Uh, yeah. And then for a while after Woody died, the son wasn't that interested in Woody's collection. Mm -hmm. the daughter was, but this was in the days where it was like uh, legacies go through the mail of the family. Mm -hmm. And at that time he ended up having, after Woody died, he ended up having uh, an arrangement with, I think it was um, Guernsey Auction House, and had this giant auction of uh, Woody Gelman's artwork, yeah. giant, and it was going for borscht because A, it wasn't, what do they call it? A mature market, original art, it was cheap, uh, and it was a lot of it, so when you'd go in, you wouldn't even know what to turn to and what to buy. It turned out that no matter how much money I ended up making over the years, Little Nemo was always a bit out of my reach, no matter what. But I did get some really beautiful dreams of a rare bit theme, oh. uh, which were fantastic. And I still have those. Um, but the son was dismantling a collection that the father had spent a lifetime putting together. He's, he, he then sobered up and began to gather together what he could. And that's what ended up at the uh, Ohio State. Billy, yeah, Billy. yeah. But, but I just thought there was this kind of interesting echo of two patricidal events. Yeah. Surrounding that little Nemo artwork. Did you uh, did you hook up uh, Crum with Woody Gelman at Tops? No, he had gotten there independent of me just about six months or a year before I was there, and that was done by Harvey Kurtzman. Oh. See, Harvey Kurtzman had hired uh, Robert, or maybe Crum came in. Whatever way it worked out, Crum started going to places like Bulgaria and Russia for Health Magazine. You may have seen some of that stuff, yeah, yeah. early journalistic sketchbook cartooning. Mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden, help. by the time Crum appeared at Help's door, uh, Christmas said, shit, well, this was the last issue. We're, we're not doing this anymore. I'm so sorry you came from, I guess, probably Cleveland at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but in any case, Woody felt, um, Kersman felt responsible for him and therefore called up his friend Woody and said, you guys have any work for him at Topps Bubblegum? So all of a sudden, 
Crum was commuting to the same neighborhood that Joey Gallo wouldn't go into at night. I was there just for a relatively short time, but did some advertising work for them, did, uh, 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 let's see, at least one series of uh, uh, funny Valentine cards, like um, little watercolor fronts for those. And then he split, but while, while he was there, he was, doing stuff for a magazine Woody was trying to put out called Nostalgia Illustrated. Some of it, I don't know how deep your archives on Chrome go. I don't have those. I have some of Nostalgia Press stuff that I've gathered up. I don't have a magazine. I don't know if it, yeah, I think it even came out, but for years he was doing this thing, but afraid to put it out because mm -hmm. it was his lifelong dream. And so lifelong dreams often get tangled with your psyche. Yeah. Um, so, but he did a piece called Heaps about cars of the past and he did another piece yeah. I don't know, about three or four pieces, illustrated pieces for Nostalgia magazine that never were published, but that did somehow come out in some of these, whatever, maybe the complete crumb has them or something. Yeah, I have seen those before, as a matter of fact, yeah. And so he was doing that stuff for the brief period he was mm -hmm. working with Woody. And so I had actually gone up to Help magazine to show, why did I go up? I'd already... What order was this in? Yeah, I guess first I'd sent some stuff into the Help Public Gallery where mm -hmm. Skip and uh, Jay, Skip Williamson and Jay Lynch had already put some stuff and they were encouraging me to send things. So I sent a batch of cartoons. I'm, I'm a bit younger than them, but I figured out what a batch was and sent them uh, and got a letter back from Harvey saying, uh, we're going out of business, but these are good. Has Hef seen these? Um, oh, geez. So I was complimented, sent stuff to Hefner. I'm sure I got a rejection. I don't remember the specifics, but I didn't appear in Playboy for till a few years after. But because Help Magazine's offices were not far from where I went to high school, I just went up there to see what was going on up there. And they really literally were clearing out the office. And I was greeted not by Harvey, who was um, AWOL, but uh, by Terry Gilliam, who was... Yeah. They're trying to clean out the offices. And he was very sweet to me, but he was busy. He was trying to clear stuff out. And I remember him pulling, trying to clear out a desk and holding up something that was a page of sketch doodles by Crum. He said, do you want this? And I looked at him and I said, nah. Uh, <laughs> I really kind of liked Crum, but it wasn't the same as the holy trinity of Davis, Elder, and Wood, and yeah. Arnold Roth by that time, who I really, whose work I loved. But Crum I liked, and he seemed rather casual. I now go back in time and kick myself. Going, oh, what's the matter with you, schmuck? Uh, but I ended up um, at least seeing that help office while it was emptying out. And that must have been, I was maybe 15 or 16. And then in, uh, let me try to figure out my dates here, 48, 58. That must have been about 63 or 64. And a couple of years later, I'd been working for Tops, mostly mm -hmm. in summers and on vacations and by mail. Uh, and I was heading out to San Francisco because I'd seen the issue of, uh, I think it was Life Magazine or Time Magazine that had a picture of a hippie on it and said, if you're going to San Francisco, wear some flowers in your hair. So I immediately got myself a van and went out to San Francisco for the first time. But it was before everything was fully um, monetized in the hippie world. <laughs> you know, it's like, it was there. But since I was going out there, Woody gave me Crumb's address so I could look him up. It was way before Zap, so it must have been about 66 or Yeah. Years are a little hazy, I'd have to look it up. But when I went out there, he was living out by the panhandle. Mm -hmm. And I met him because we were fellow Tops gum workers, not anything else. And he was showing me pages from Zap and things like that. He was working on Zap Zero, probably, or one. And it was right after his LSD trip, where he had kind of gotten uh, his brain invaded by Basil Wolverton and other uh, blue collar. Mm -hmm. or types that were changing his work and I was my mind was totally blown by this he was in an apartment that had a lot of old cathedral radios that were kind of hand painted and his wife at the time Dana who I really thought was his mother I, I mean <laughs> years later I thought it was his mother really? uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we got along really well but then while I was up there I remember saying you know I thought I was going to become the messiah of comics, but there's no need for a messiah of comics. Why don't you do it? You are doing it. Uh, so I just blurted out whatever vague ideas I had about what comics should become, mm -hmm. left his apartment, 
went into Golden Gate Park, which was right next door to where he was living, and dropped a rather large amount of acid and was just sitting somewhere in the middle of the park. Wow. And uh, um, so you were so you were doing acid in Golden Gate Park? Yes. So this must have been 66, 67, 67 probably. Um, and I had sort of at that point figured I'm not going to become a cartoonist anymore. I can, I'll still draw. I mean, I'd been already getting published and doing things as a cartoonist, but I hadn't fulfilled any of my ambitions. And seeing Crumb's work uh, blew me away and set me back, let's say. Hmm. As one thing we discovered when we were working on Raw, uh, finding artists that we wanted to include uh, from Europe and from around the US. I was working on Raw and we would meet these artists, like just looking them up because they were the kind of people we wanted to work with. And that would include very disparate types. I think I might have met Sword already, mm -hmm. uh, but I hadn't met uh, Mariscal, Jack Tardy, Jose Munoz, uh, and a lot of the Europeans that became part of Raw. And what was interesting is when we'd find, the, find them and we'd talk, they, we would look at their earlier work. Every mm -hmm. one of them had to go through the equivalent of Stanley Kubrick's monolith. Mm -hmm and get evolved. And the way that, that that monolith was called Crumb. So every one of them, no matter what their drawing style looked like, and, and say Mariscal and Crumb and Tardy are very different from each other, they all had a period where they're drawing big feet trucking and little kind of uh, rapidograph cross hatching. It's like in order to move into the present and thereby after that, the future, one had to pass through Crumb's work. And that was true for me as well. So I, I, it actually set me back. I was better off when I was looking at the same things Crum was looking at, but not knowing that or thinking that much about his work. So I ended up having to like um, move back to jail, did not pass go and learn stuff all over again to find out how to become an underground cartoonist. Yeah, but when you met him, were you already published in like The Realist and Wit's End? Yeah, yeah. You were already hippie. trying to be a hippie artist at that point. I mean, because yeah, I've seen some of your work. I was, at the... I was an alienated cartoonist who knew what I didn't want to do, which was uh, the normal trajectory for trying to make a living as a cartoonist. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was trying, but not doing it right. Um, but I was already doing things that were kind of surrealistic in my college newspaper. I think some of those eventually gotten reprinted one place or another. Yeah. Uh, a very strange comic strip. Yeah. Uh, so that was kind of psychedelic. But a lot of the other stuff wasn't. It was just sort of angst-ridden beatnik comics or something. I was too young to yeah. be a beatnik. But still... Um, and, and the basic thing that was happening to me was all of a sudden I had to go and figure out, oh, you've got to be as disgusting and outrageous as you can be and clutter it up as much as you can. And mm -hmm. it was a whole new school to go to. Prior to that, I'd been in a, a high school called the High School of Art and Design, which was uh, formerly called the School of Industrial Art. And it was the, the only commercial art high school uh, in New York that uh, taught cartooning. Mm -hmm. And so I didn't care what their academic chops were. Like, I just wanted to be at a school that taught cartooning. And so I'd commute to Manhattan to go to the school where you have to had to show a portfolio. It was more downscale than um, music and art, which is where uh, Al Feldstein, Harvey Kurtzman, Al Jaffe, and others had gone. That was the one where you learned to be a musician or a fine artiste. Mm -hmm. uh, but this was a real cartooning school, started in the Depression, and it had me in New York City where I could walk to the health magazine offices and stuff. And you'd have a much longer school day than you would if you stayed in your own neighborhood high school, uh, twice as long so you could do some academics and also still have four hours. And as a result, I took the cartooning classes as soon as I could declare my major. And one of the assignments was to do syndicated strip samples, just to try it out. Yeah. And... One day, our teacher, this amazing uh, man named Charles Allen, uh, who's a black cartoonist who found it was easier to get a uh, job through the Board of Education as a cartoon teacher than make a living as a freelance gag cartoonist. Mm -hmm. uh, and another person in that school named Al Hollingsworth, who was an early comic book artist, another black artist who got to do his job teaching illustration at that school, and somebody who I only met once at that time and intimidated me, Bernie Krigstein was teaching there oh, as well. Wow. And it was a school that goes way back, like an entire generation of DC and Marvel uh, cartoonists had gone to the School of Industrial Art that became the High School of Art and Design. Yeah. And 
anyway, back to the narrative I was trying to follow, but you have me on memory lane at this point. And since I don't have a memory, it's a long trip. Uh, <laughs> But basically, this guy came who had been an, an editor, was at that time an editor for the National NEA, whatever that stands for, yeah. one of the syndicates, and looked at the work the class had and talked about becoming a cartoonist and called me over at the end and said, could you do two more weeks of this? I'm going to groom you for syndication, kid. So I had done like about three or four dailies just because that was the assignment. Mm -hmm. And then I went home really excited because that was like going from the basement to the penthouse without going through the rest of the building. Uh, but after about four more days, I was going, oh, fuck. This, this sucks. I have to do another one, you know, just to get to the two weeks worth. And by the time I was getting like the stack together, I realized this is not the kind of cartoonist I want to be. Like, if you're lucky, you get to spend your life doing the same thing every day. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just never went back to see him. But I'd had this amazing ticket that I didn't cash in, but it did show me what I didn't want to do. At that time, I was maybe more interested in trying to crack the gag cartoon market. So we'd send things into various cheapo magazines as did Jay Lynch. Um, and that seemed maybe interesting, but I was more interested in comics than in gag cartoons, but I was trying that. And in fact, one thing I remembered, if you don't mind my absolute free association version of my past, yeah. um, that point, Jay and I, who we were, we were in correspondence mostly because he was not living in New York. Uh, both decided we would try to crack the New Yorker mm -hmm. and we decided uh, to send in gag cartoons. And we knew what batches were and how to do it at that point. Uh, and so we both decided, I, th I think it was my epiphany, but I may be wrong, that the point of uh, New Yorker gag cartoons is you're not supposed to get them. <laughs> so we made up these non sequitur gag cartoons. <laughs> Uh, intentionally ungettable. I don't remember what Jay's name was. He'd signed not with his own name. And I signed mine Hippie, H-I-P-P-I. -P -P -I, but I think it was before I was a hippie, before hippies were even a common phrase. But that's how I signed the cartoons. Uh, and we, of course, got rejection slips. But that was my first attempt to crack the New Yorker. What was uh, that? You had another, you, Skeeter Grant was another name? Skeeter Grant. Yeah, I used that on occasion when I didn't want to sign my name to something. Because you didn't like what you were working on? Is that why? Uh, it was being done faster. Oh. Uh, and so I didn't want to like make it part of my oeuvre. Like Stan Lee wanted to save his real name, Stan Lee Lieber, for his serious novels. Uh, so maybe it was that, or maybe it's just I didn't want a Jewish last name or something. Oh, you know? interesting. Skeeter Grant. <laughs> yeah, well, it sounded like an old-time cartoonist. And in fact, at some point in my life, I started working on his biography. Never mm -hmm. did it. I ended up switching over to Mao's. Uh, but I wanted to do the biography of Skeeter Grant, who was born in time to be one of the first generation uh, uh, newspaper artists mm. and um, had a big success in about 1910 or so called Poot, the Spunky Pup. Uh, made a fortune, had lots of ghosts doing his comics, moved to France uh, <laughs> where he tried to be a painter, had no luck at that but then decided that cart comics were as good an art form as painting mm -hmm. and put out his own magazine called Le Poot Gris, <laughs> Gris Poot, uh, and was hiring people like uh, uh, Picasso to do comics and cartoons for his Le Poot Gris and could bankroll it because he was making millions from his ghosted comic strip back in America. Then anyway, his whole life would take place until at that point, it must have been uh, mid seventies, uh, I figured he would die then, but have been born in about 1875, 1880. And most of it, once I met Francoise, was going to be done using our printing press. Mm -hmm. I could do all the little artifacts, like the Tijuana Bibles he drew when he was on the skids in the 30s, <laughs> and uh, his diary as a separate booklet. So it's going to be a book in a box with his diary and uh, reprints of Poot as if they were those old McKay. Yeah. Um, Com early comics collections, yeah. um, not Windsor, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. Those mm -hmm. square books that we do bring yeah. your father. Yeah, so we're going to have all this stuff that we printed on the small press. But once I met Francoise, I was all, already living back in New York, and this required that I um, eventually cop to my father that I was living in the city, yeah, uh, rather than in California, and would have to meet him. And I really didn't want to as I think the book demonstrated we had a fraught relationship. And when I went out to see him is when I really decided what I have to be working on is mouse, not this 
uh, metafictional uh, life of a non-existent cartoonist named Skeeter Grant. Well, it's on the back burner, right? You could always get back to it if you wanted to. I could, but you know, I'm glad I went in the direction I did because I think, first of all, now it's been done. I mean, because every, I, I always used to think, oh, I was 100 years ahead of my time. And I found out like 10 minutes, maybe. Even if I'd gotten there first, it would have been seen as, by the time I finished, assuming it took almost as long as Mouse to do that project, which was a 13 year project, by that time, I would have just been called a postmodernist and it would have been over, you know, like it, it's, uh, it, it wouldn't have had the same impact as what I was doing out of sheer necessity, uh, which yeah. was coming to terms with my parents in their past. How come you never had your own solo title, like underground comic, like the other guys did? Uh, too not prolific. Did, was that something that you wanted, though? I mean, did you ever think like, you know, I should have my own title? It didn't seem practical considering how... I mean, I, I, I got to tell you that I didn't know how long anything would take me when I started it, like mm -hmm. no matter what it was. And looking back at the dates on some of these things, you know, I did one page called uh, Don't Get Around Much Anymore. And it's still a page I'm very proud of. Uh, and I feel it's under-recognized even for what it did. It took me about four months to do that one page. Mm. Uh, and I, I think I lost my then relationship over it because when I was finally finished and my girlfriend breathed a great sigh of relief. I ripped it up and started it again because I was pissed oh. when it came out. Um, so I can't imagine how I would do a whole book unless I'd have issue number one come out when I was 50. Uh, so were you the guy who like, they would invite you to be like a part of uh, like an anthology comic and then they'd be like, we gotta wait for art. Come on art, get your page in. Somehow deadlines were loose enough so it could happen. You know, okay. I, um, in fact, it's even how I ended up doing mouse. I needed deadlines, but needed to violate them. Mm -hmm. And so when we were doing raw, and I realized that was, I'd been offered, uh, there's a magazine in France at the time called A Suivre mm -hmm. to be continued. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it's what started running Tardy's more mature stuff. This yeah. was in the 70s that it started, late 70s. And I got to be very close with Tardy at the period. He introduced me up to this brand new magazine and they liked the idea of, and that's what got me to coalesce how I was going to proceed with Mouse. Mm -hmm. I had to like make a kind of outline of what the whole thing would be, show some sample pages. But they wanted to do Mouse, except the catch was I had to do eight pages a month. Oh, yeah. And I hadn't even figured out how I was going to draw it. I just had a, a kind of outline that Francois translated into French. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was going to be the way I'd get Mouse done. Didn't work out. And uh, when we started doing Raw, I thought it was a one shot just to show what should happen in comics because I'd been trying to get uh, various magazines I was working for like High Times and Playboy uh, to use more sophisticated comics. Like High Times, every comic had to be about getting stoned. Mm -hmm. Playboy, it had to be about boobs. It, it um, seemed like if they could give Nabokov space in Playboy, yeah. They had room for comics that were more sophisticated than what they were running and couldn't get anybody to go along with it. And that's when uh, Francois said, well, why don't we do a magazine and show what it should be? And at that point, this was 1980, uh, maybe end of 79 that we first started talking about. It, I said, well, let's do it once just to show them what it should be, mm -hmm. uh, the world then. And uh, Francois says she always knew we were going to do more, but this was the only way to get me to come along for the ride. So the first issue of Raw had a book, a booklet based on something I'd been working on without knowing how I was going to publish it, maybe on the press we had here. Those two uh, two painters. Painters. Yeah. So that became the insert into the first issue of Raw. But then when I came around to like having to do Raw more consistently, I figured I can't leave Mouse, which I was in the middle of trying to organize and figure out as of 1978. Um, said, okay, uh, I guess I'll do a booklet for each issue of Raw Magazine. That's the way I'll build this thing. And then we talked about how often the magazine would come out. And uh, I said, well, and I had this advantage, which is my English was a lot better than this beautiful French woman I was living with. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, we're going to do it as a biannual. And she said, basically, qu'est-ce que c'est? And I said, well, it's something that either comes out twice a year or once every two years. And it's because I didn't quite know what bi how biannual got to mean semi-annual, but it did. Uh, and it also could mean once every two years. And I figured within that bracket, I could do a chapter of Mouse. Yeah. 
So really an issue of Raw would come out when I finally was able to meet the deadline toward an issue. Um, and that seemed to be once a year, sometimes in some instances twice in a year, uh, mm -hmm. get some chapter done. And you would just try, you would find the artist that you wanted to and just, and you would just say basically like, whatever right. you're working on, can we have it? Well, it was always do what you want to do. And, and by invitation, mostly we found a few things otherwise. Uh, and we just never, we never had a real schedule of when we were going to make the next issue. It's just, you'll be in the next issue. Okay. And that, that was fine because for the American artists, there weren't many places to go that could do work as interesting as one could publish in, in Raw. And, and the reason we found the artists we found was they had another common denominator besides all being influenced by Crumb, which is every one of them tried to find a way of making comics that wasn't what was being done around them. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they were trying to articulate something as opposed to just find a place in the business. Yeah. And so, these, so basically we were finding a series of sweet, generous comics artists who didn't have that much in common with each other except that crumb sketchbook, uh, but also had something really extraordinary, which ended up being almost all of these cartoonists ended up having schools of their own. In other words, uh, after Gary Panter, there were like 20 other Gary Panthers marching behind them. After Mariscal, there were lots of Mariscals. After Chris Ware, voila, uh, we're in the present. Uh, but all of these cartoonists at the time weren't in the school of, they were themselves. So this became how we would find artists. And the European stuff was a bit easier. Occasionally they would give us new stuff, but there's so much that hadn't been printed in America because almost none of this had been printed except some of the borderline cases might have been in Metal Horlant or something. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe Yost had a couple of things in an underground comic here or there. Uh, yeah. So that was easy and it always made it possible to put together an issue and each issue of Raw would die and get reborn from its own ashes like a phoenix. It would be like, wow, that's another fun thing we'll never do again. And it was exhausting. Um, but when we do it, it would be often because we'd find an artist we hadn't known before or an artist we had known was doing something really ambitious. Mm -hmm. And I would focus us on, uh, us on finding an issue that we could build a special place for that work. Like at one point I remember it was Pascal Dory. It was like, holy God, how did this stuff happen? Yeah. And uh, you let Paul Karasik take over edit editorship of one issue? No, never. I thought he, I thought he edited the one with Fletcher Hanks in it. He issue. worked on the Fletcher Hanks pieces, retouching them and... Oh, okay. He didn't edit it? No. But uh, no, Paul was an assistant, uh, first oh. an intern and then helped around, but, and did work on the Fletcher Hanks stuff. But the Fletcher Hanks stuff came our way uh, through Jerry Moriarty, who was an amazing uh, artist and is, I suppose he's still alive, we're not in touch, but uh, amazing cartoonist. We did a one shot of his called Jack Survives and printed his things in Raw Magazine. And um, he had all this great stuff in his house, including uh, being able to introduce us to uh, Stardust and his comic book collection of these things. And as soon as we saw it, it was like, we want that, we wanna have that. That'll be an issue of Raw and it was fine with him. So then we had to figure out a way to blow out the color and uh, fix the lines because nobody had original. I don't, I don't think anybody now has original Fletcher Hanks art, maybe they do. Yeah. Uh, but having to like re-ink and straighten out the edges of these things uh, was Paul's job on Fletcher Hanks, but he got introduced to it through hmm. me, through Jerry Moriarty. It's never looked better too than in that issue of Raw. I mean, the, those pages are so beautiful. Like just the way the color is laid down on them and stuff, it's just. Yeah, that's crazy. mostly thanks to Francoise who cut, the, so I remember she cut the separations. Yeah. Um, and she got, re she was really good at that, you know? Yeah, and yeah. The other thing was um, we did it on newsprint, so it had to look good. Yeah, that's right. It would sink in and not be garish, you know? Oh, but actually when I, when I first met Francoise, speaking of her color separation skills, do mm -hmm. you mind my free associating like no this? please yeah yeah, yeah. what you were hoping i don't know yeah no uh, okay uh so when i first met francoise she was working as uh a plumber's assistant electrician's assistant uh what else a, a architectural <laughs> renderer model maker for a, a japanese architecture company occasional translator and house painter. Uh, oh, and a cigarette girl working in um, 
Grand Central Station selling cigarettes from a kiosk. Oh and that's God. how she was putting together her illegal status living. <laughs> uh, and so we got together then. She was mostly doing house painting, electricity, and plumbing with uh, somebody who knew more about it than she did. Mm -hmm. uh, but we got together when I was working at Tops one or two days a week, I would show up there. And I was already in the midst of finishing up breakdowns as a book. And I was very interested in making color separations and doing stuff. And there's a couple of simple separations I was working on while she was staying over at my village apartment. And I had to get up early. And for us, we were both, when we did, she had to be on day schedule to work at some of her jobs. I didn't. So the top stay was always a traumatic day for me. I had to get up and get somewhere by 9.30 or 10 o'clock. It was 45 minute subway ride to get there or something. Um, but I was getting up to go and I said, shit, I really wanted to finish this separation. Separation, qu'est-ce que c'est? And I was trying to just give her a crash course on one foot and said, see, I have these overlays. And uh, when you put the zipper tone down, you got to be really careful that they don't make moiré patterns and use this triangle to blah, blah, blah. Um, and there's a color chart for how to use it. I made my chart for what I needed for that page already of how much percentage of uh, magenta with a 30% screen and how much yellow with a 40% screen or whatever. Uh, and I just showed it to her while I was going out, but that was the end of it. And then I come back at the end of the day and the separation was impeccably done. <laughs> never done anything like it before, although she'd done architectural work because she trained to be an architect. Yeah. But it wasn't the hardest separation she did. That was probably the cover of Raw 2 where she colored uh, Yo Swartz uh, cover. And it was a, a masterclass in what one could do with Zipatone. Yeah, uh, right. separation. But she learned it like in about 10 minutes, which makes her kind of scary. Uh, <laughs> took me way longer just to learn to do simple ones. And she was much neater than I was. But anyway, she I'm pretty sure did the separations for the Fletcher Hanks stuff. I think there's another page, maybe like on the at, after that, I think it's just like mostly an advertising page. And mm -hmm. it's just like so gorgeous, like all the colors and stuff like that in there. And then I think there's even like a little Mariscal comic on that page as well. I'm not uh, quite which one you mean, but they're little square class. Yeah, a little square, like you know, like uh, it'd be like the Danceteria, like advertisements. That's, okay, yes, I know those pages. Those were great cool. things because if you had to have advertising, that was the way to do it. Of course, it made no money because of how much time it took to design and make the pages, but yeah. it made some money for some of the artists who would get paid to make the drawing that would be part of that square ad, mm -hmm. uh, and it paid something. It helped, but um, really, the secret advertising supplement for Raw was something called the Streets of Soho Map and Guide. I've yeah. heard about this, but I've never seen one before. If you ever get to see, I think in the comics book that mm -hmm. came out as part of, as a kind of retrospective when my- Yeah, yeah, I've seen the covers of them, but I haven't seen it like opened up and- Oh stuff. yeah, well, geez, I'm sure there's one here, but it may not be worth looking for. Oh, you don't need, it's fine, yeah, yeah. Well, what it was was, oh, let's see. This was when Francoise was looking for a way to make a living. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had a friend who ran the bookstore on Spring Street that had been, was uh, basically owned by uh, Tom Forsad, who started High Times. And he was a good friend. And we'd stop in every once in a while and chat, either Francoise or me or both. And every time we'd be in there talking to him at the cash register, somebody would come in and say, where's Wooster Street? Because this part of the city is not built on this simple grid that even I can understand. Uh, mm -hmm. But Soho is terra incognita. And he said, somebody should do a fucking map of this neighborhood. Uh, mm -hmm. And then said, my entrepreneurial top self said, yeah, somebody should, you know? And like, I knew that Francoise could make maps that her architectural background made that easy. Mm -hmm. uh, but what wasn't that obvious was the business model for such a thing. Yeah. And what that was, was to do a map where the advertisements at first just didn't look like advertisements at all. Mm -hmm. They're just little bullets along the map that said, this is where this gallery is, this is where this clothing store is, this is where this grocery store is. And then the really hard part came along, which proved to me that Francoise is this polymath that can, that can just do anything, which is, okay, so what has to happen is we have to go to the stores and sell them on this ad that doesn't look like an ad, but it's a listing on the map for which you would pay 50 oh, yeah. bucks. And then you would sell the map in your store. Uh, so as soon as you hit Soho, there'd be these little counter displays everywhere with the streets of Soho map and guide. I did the cover 
in a kind of new, sophisticated New Yorker couple uh, uh, frolicking along the loading docks and galleries. Um, Francoise designed the map and we designed together like aspects of how this would work. Francoise certainly oversaw the printing. It was a bit too big to do on her press. Um, but the hard part was selling these damn listings because if you didn't have certain galleries on it, the map was useless. Yeah. Um, so Francoise has a lot of skills. Selling is not a natural for her. She's not that kind of person. I made her life harder because I was earning my keep at the bubblegum company, thank you. But mm -hmm. she could do this that might be easier than like uh, getting electric shocks while learning electricity or something. Mm -hmm. um, and she actually had to go out and sell. And so she, I think she might've even read a book on selling. I'd have to call her over and find out exactly how she uh, steals herself for it. I made her life harder because we had to name the publishing company. Mm -hmm. And at that time I decided we would call it Crass Publications because I was really down on the notion of advertising. Yeah. And again, my advantage in English made her just not know crass publications. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but then she'd have to go and says, oh, bonjour, je suis from crass publications. <laughs> uh, and somehow she worked it and eventually found an assistant after the first year to like, she'd hire people to be the sales force that she would energize and go out. But you could never take no for an answer. Mm -hmm. So you'd always have to go back and make enough of a pest for, of yourself to show why it was essential for them to be listed on this map since everybody else is. And I think on occasion, give them a free listing for the first year so they could see how useful it was. But as a result, it was a very credible thing. And in the course of about three months of really engaged work, she could do something that would earn enough money for the year. Hmm. Uh, and that meant that we had enough money to print and publish Raw Magazine as we moved on, because Rudd couldn't turn a profit, really. Yeah. What it would do is when we got more money than we spent on it, we had something called the Raw Deal, which was every artist would get paid based on their percentage of work mm -hmm. and divided into the profits of the magazine after printing costs and stuff. And it was called the raw deal because we'd worked it out on the, with the idea that uh, it's harder to do a good one pager than a good three pager. Yeah. And it's harder to do a good three pager than it is to do a good 12 pager. Not for me because it takes forever, but in terms of difficulty of making the piece good. Uh, and a reprint should pay a little less. So Francoise, who also had great mathematical skills, figured out the algebraic equations of what X was. And then when you did a three pager, it would be uh, X plus two thirds X plus half X or something. And then one page was worth X and 10 pages would be worth something like that. So that was the raw deal. And it, it, a little bit better it usually meant people earning only 25 or 50 dollars a page or something but it was as good as underground comic rates at the time it was never done for the money either by us or the artists in it well how did you know when it was time to end raw that's an interesting question let's see uh i think after the eighth issue uh it's probably around 87 I 87 think. okay 87. so two things were happening then uh one is uh, mouse was about to become a book yeah uh, at least volume one, which I was originally going to do it as one big book. And then after working from 78 to 86, it seemed like maybe it's time to publish something to gather together, yeah. which was made more urgent because I'd gotten a clipping saying that uh, this guy named Steven Spielberg was coming out with American Tale. And I, I'm sure to this day that it was a ripoff by Ralph, not Ralph Bakshi. Uh, Don, Don Bluth? Don Bluth. I got it right. I just didn't believe it. Yeah. Okay. So Don Bluth was there. I know 85% certainty that since Roe was so visible there, mm -hmm. they must have picked it up and then seen this mouse thing in the back. Scumbag. And then I'm sure that I can imagine, and it's only my fantasy, an idea meeting out in Hollywood saying, yeah, man, but you know, Auschwitz is a real bummer. <laughs> uh, yeah, but cats and mice are good, although that guy doesn't draw them real well, but we could draw them like this. And then saying, but you know, Auschwitz really is a bummer. I said, yeah, but you know, we could do one of those fiddler on the roof kind of things. Yep. Um, so I just know how it developed and I freaked out. Mm -hmm. And at some point I found volunteer lawyers for the arts, which is an organization that could represent relatively indigent artists to talk about uh, fighting off Spielberg. Mm -hmm. um, and it was the same organization that had helped Francoise and I get married. I, that wasn't their job, but they were a very amenable bunch, bunch of lawyers doing pro bono work. And we had to keep her in the country 
after she'd been illegal and we were going to have to get married and do all these things. So they helped us through that process. Uh, but when I started seeing what was involved in using uh, a pro bono lawyer to fight Spielberg and knowing that like this was never going to work, either I was totally stopped drawing comics or I'd just become a litigant for the rest of my life and join the line of people who were suing him for every other movie he had made, uh, ranging from um, Indiana Jones to whatever. There were all his lawsuits around Spielberg movies. So I didn't have, didn't know what to do, but my friend Bruno Richard, who was, uh, who was one of the artists, who was, he was the artist working with Pascal Jury and they had a really interesting art zine in Paris called she went out, Elson Sorti, mm -hmm. uh, and he and Gary Panter were good friends. But anyway, he always was effusive with his ideas and said, what you must do is publish the first part now. Mm -hmm. That's smart. So I went to Pantheon and said, okay, we've had this contract since whatever it was, 1981 or something. Uh, how about publishing the first half as a book? He said, absolutely not. That's crazy. We'll just wait longer. No, nobody's waiting for your book. Um, but then, because uh, nobody's waiting for your book. <laughs> nobody's waiting for your book. But then I know what happened. A guy named Ken Tucker, the music critic for uh, the Village Voice and elsewhere, uh, had seen Mao's in Raw and did a piece about it uh, for the Sunday Times book review at a time when the Sunday Times was really all powerful. Now books aren't all powerful, let alone anything talking about books. But yeah. um, he wrote a piece about Mao's well as a serialized thing appearing in an, uh, some kind of weird underground magazine mm -hmm. and wrote a full page essay about it. Didn't make any sense because the Sunday Times book review almost never covered small press, never covered anything in comics, never covered works in progress. I don't know how he pulled this thing off, but it was a very intelligent essay in the course of which he mentions that eventually the book will be published by Pantheon. Uh, so that led to such a flood of letters to Pantheon saying, when can we get this book? Oh, wow. All of a sudden they, they got to think that, hey, maybe volume one isn't such a bad idea. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that led to, that's what led to the jump and heartbeat move to let's stop doing this large size role because that's a full-time job, even though it takes forever. Yeah. And I focused on getting the first volume together. Mm -hmm. And what they agreed to do was a paperback book and that, and, uh, that time Andre Schifrin promised me to do a full book when it was finished as a hardcover. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was at that point when I'd already done the first chapter of what became the second book that was, I'd have to look through the Raws to find out what happened when, but I think we all, I think Raw 8 already had the first chapter of what became the second book. Yeah. Um, so at that point, Things got a little bit off kilter. Plus, in 1987, Naja was born. Yeah. Uh, and Francoise was, um, her, I think that's about the time she was going to uh, Hunter College uh, and learning to be a doctor. Uh, so things changed. And when things changed, uh, I had already had this idea. And as things were settling into what do we do next, uh, I wanted to do. And maybe I don't remember who, how the conversation took place. Francoise was fine with it, but she was relatively taking a back seat when she started working on her her uh, pre med stuff. Yeah. Uh, she's going, oh, I don't know, like working with cartoonists. You have a big enough ego. Working with about twenty of them has been too much, you know. When she was when she was um, invited to become the uh, cover editor for the New Yorker after I'd been doing some things up there, Tina. Wanted to, Tina Brown, the then editor, uh, wanted to meet her to talk about whether she would maybe become the art editor of the New Yorker for covers. Mm -hmm. uh, when she had asked me who I thought should be there, it didn't occur to me that they'd want Francoise, because Francoise specifically had said, I never want to have anything to do with artists again. Uh, so, but after she got invited in, started talking about it, and it happened. But back in eight, about 87, about, uh, I really, if I was in my studio, it'd be a lot easier to open up and figure out what happened exactly when and look at the yeah. copyright dates. But somewhere around this time, uh, I wanted to do something that would have longer stories in it. Mm -hmm. And to do a full size raw, which was the size of Life magazine, Wet magazine, uh, almost interview magazine. Yeah. Um, we uh, 
couldn't really do that many long, long stories because the eventually it would become prohibitive. Even when we were doing a, a $5 comic book that was like seen as like the snootiest thing anybody could do with us eat cake eaters. Uh, but we couldn't possibly do a fat enough one to do long stories and it'd be too big for some of them anyway, uh, dimension wise. So uh, I got interested in the idea of doing a magazine that would be like Granta. Mm -hmm. uh, literary magazine would come out in bookstores as well as magazines stands designed like a book and would be the small size raw. And again, I'd, I'd have to look through my papers to find dates, but I met some people at Penguin uh, who wanted to do something with me. And then we talked about uh, doing this Granta like magazine called Raw. Mm -hmm. And that allowed for 20 page stories and lots of stuff to fill it up. After the, per the first issue sold about as well, or maybe a little better as the last big size Raw, but then each successive issue would sell exponentially less. Mm -hmm. uh, so by the third issue, it seemed like this isn't a great way to proceed. But those three are a separate entity, which is like raw volume two, which were yeah. nice, like that issue. Uh, 